Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo, as always, joined by Joe Rasinello. And once more, dear brothers and sisters, let us go into the breach on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network, 1350 on your AM dial, 103.9 on your FM dial, spreading the truth of the Catholic faith to the New York City metropolitan area. Uh, two things, please download the app, share it with your friends. You're going to have access to all of our station's content, not just the front line with Joe and Joe. Remember, we are an EWTN affiliate, so you get uh, EWTN content and our original programming, including Bishop Caggiano. Um, and also, if you like what Joe and I do, we get in real trouble on social media Thursday nights, 9 o'clock Eastern time, and we're all across Rumble, X, Facebook, YouTube, wherever you see us. Uh, we put up a ton of stuff. We put up these interviews. Please help us out. Like, subscribe, share, do all that fun stuff. Again, if you like, you know, if you like what we're doing, I assume if you're listening, you like what we're doing. So hit a button for us, will you? Uh, and today we're very pleased and honored to be joined by Meredith Hines. And we're going to be discussing her new book out from Tan Books, Eucharistic Saints, 20 Stories of Devotion to Jesus. Joe, I think we all could use a little bit more devotion if you ask me, particularly in America in, in general. So this is going to be a great topic. Uh, some of you out there, might be familiar with Meredith. Uh, having said that, she is a writer, editor, and Catholic convert uh, who lives in Colorado with her family. Her first project for children was A Saint a Day, a devotional about heroes of the Christian faith published by Tommy Nelson. When she's not writing about saints, Meredith is probably reading with her own children, writing about family life and trying to find her gratitude, uh, trying to find her gratitude journal. That, that's funny because I lose things all the time. Uh, <laughs> Meredith writes a uh, free weekly newsletter called Still Today. It's about faith, family, and sometimes saints. Meredith Hines, welcome to the front line with Joe and Joe. Thank you so much. I didn't butcher the bio, did I? What? Did I get did I get everything? Yeah, in the bio you got right? the bio. You got the bio right. Yeah. All no, right. I'm I'm a writer and an editor. I converted to the Catholic faith about eight years ago now. And so my husband and I got married around that same time and we're raising five kids. And I can do, I ask, um, yeah, again, just and then we'll get into the book, but I'm always fascinated because sure. Joe will tell you when it comes to um non-Catholic Christians, sometimes the, you know, I get a little frustrated. So I just want to ask a quick question. So it, was it a, what is it, was it a, um, all of a sudden hit you at one point? I think the Catholic faith is correct. Was it something in particular that, that drew you to the Catholic faith? What, what brought you to the church? Well, my husband and I, he, well, wasn't my husband at the time we were dating. So we were dating, deciding whether or not we wanted to get married. Um, he was very interested in the Catholic church and both of us had grown up evangelical Protestant. And for me, there was just kind of this sense that this wasn't everything. Uh, the people around me who raised me really loved Jesus and taught me a lot about God, but it just felt like there was something that was missing. And so when we were starting the process of RCIA, it's interesting that I ended up writing this book in particular because it was the Eucharist. It was the truth about the Eucharist that all of a sudden it just like, it was like, this is what I've been looking for. This is the piece that was missing. Uh, Christ physically present in the Eucharist with us always. And I just, I held on to that and I never let go. And through all of the things that were difficult about converting to the Catholic faith, that's something that I've really just held on to is that this is the truth that Christ is physically present in the Eucharist. He's with us. He has given himself to us and does so continually. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really just stayed with me. And I think that I love the description of the Eucharist as the source and summit of the Christian faith, because it does describe my own journey. Um, because there was something that was missing and this is what it was. It was this piece. So I think, uh, I, I, I think, and then we'll get, we'll get into your book. If you're just joining us here, Meredith Hines is with us at the front line with Joe and Joe. Her new book is out from Tan book, the Tan books, Eucharistic saints, 20 stories of devotion to Jesus. If I, I, I can't get into arguments or even conversations, quite frankly, <laughs> um, with evangelicals, but I would say this, if I was going to, I would, I would focus on two things and in this order, argue against sola scriptura, and then argue that in John 6, Jesus is saying, literally, this is my flesh and blood, and says it twice. So when well, they all say, wow, that's kind of crazy, yeah, maybe he'll clarify. That's my, that's the Italian, that's the Newark, New Jersey way of interpreting scripture. 
So they all say like, maybe he'll, he'll, he'll like, he'll clarify and he doubles down. And, right. Right. You know, I would and argue those two things. That I think, I think bringing up the bread of life discourse is always, um, it's a good thing when, and when you're finding yourself in those conversations, what I've found, because we still have many family members who are Protestants, um, those conversations really can only go so far. Like you can sow the seed of like, what about John six, you know, those kinds of things. And then maybe they can take it away and like, look at that later without the context of that conversation. Cause I know what you mean. Those can get really loaded and really like full of emotion. Um, and the other thing that I think is really important to do um, with the Protestants that you have in your life is invite them to any kind of sacramental event, like mm -hmm. any kind of like first communion, baptism, whatever it is, just open the door there. Be like, this is please come. And then they decide what they're going to do. Right. But mm -hmm. it is, it is the reality of the sacraments that is going to convince people, you know, not necessarily like our convincing words. Right. Right. You know and I believe mean? me, like I, I, I've given up on trying. I, I already, you know, I yeah, don't have any like, expectations that not... I'm bringing anybody into the church or I'm going to argue them. Joe says on the show here all the time, nobody's arguing anybody into the church. I'm with no. you now. If I yeah. can plant a seed, you, you know, maybe maybe you know a little bit where catholics don't have the greatest reputation as far as knowing scripture i mean that's unfortunate <laughs> but that's the case right. um but when i had my experience is that when a non-catholic christian uh encounters a catholic who does actually know scripture right uh, or knows enough to to know and support uh the you know the staying with the catholic faith i those people are somewhat impressed and it's like you said perhaps they'll mm -hmm. take the seed take it home and maybe think about it and then let the Holy right. spirit do the rest. I exactly. ain't the Holy spirit. Or, yeah, no, it is. And, but I mean, I, I know like for me, these are people who are in my family who I love so much. And you just, what you want is you want them to be in the fullness of the church. You want them to be in the embrace of the church. And it's difficult to step back and to let the Holy spirit do the work that the Holy spirit does, even though of course the Holy spirit is going to do it so much better than you can. It's difficult to take that step back and to kind of breathe and pray and ask God, like, please come in, in this place and to be patient and to be patient and allow like the time that has to pass. And then one of the things that I've always found hilarious is it's not necessary. Well, I mean, of course you're important to your family members, but sometimes it's going to be a different family. Like it's going to be a different family who has that impact on your sibling that helps like bring them into the church. So yeah, patience, invite people to those sacramental events, like get them in the presence of Jesus. If you can, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing and just allow God to do his work. So absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Thank you yeah. for that, Meredith. I know right. it was it obviously specifically about your book, but it's something that Joe and I, yeah. um, we're always interested in, in, in a per person's, you know, story where, you, you know, coming into the church, coming from mm -hmm. an evangelical background. So thank you so much. If you're just joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe, Meredith Hines is with us. She's written a new book, U Eucharistic Saints, 20 Stories of Devotion to Jesus. That's out from Tam Books. Joe Racinello. Meredith, we always start uh, the conversation with the prayer. So let's just say a quick prayer to Our Lady in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, never was it known that anyone who sought your help or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly into you, a virgin of virgins, our mother. To you we come, for you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in your clemency hear and answer us. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Speaking specifically about the book, Eucharistic Saints, saints resonate with people because they're examples. They point to Christ. I mean, ultimately, you know, when you start thinking about Jesus, you start thinking about Mary, um, even though Mary was born of a man and a woman, she still was perfect. And most people actually know people are perfect. Me being in the front of that line. But when you look at saints, um, they're regular people. They're sinners who keep yeah. trying. And frankly, they speak to me. Um, let's talk about that because I do think it's an effective tool. Saints resonate with people and mm -hmm. they resonate with children. Absolutely. Children look at, at superheroes. Well, guess what? Saints are superheroes. They're better than superheroes. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. How do saints resonate with children specifically? Well, I think that when children look at the saints, they see them in a certain historical context too. You know what I mean? Like you've got saints who are part of history. And so the children see 
this saint, they were part of a family. They grew up, they learned the faith. They decided to, you know, go on the mission that they were going on. And I think that children see saints in their own time and it makes it like, it's this link. It kind of makes it possible to think of ourselves as a saint too, that we could model our life based on somebody else who lived really faithfully in the time that they lived in. So I think that children love hearing these stories and they love hearing these stories about these people who lived during a certain time, just like we're going to, we're going to be living in the time that we're living in. And we see these great examples of faithfulness throughout history. And I think that that means a lot to kids. You know, also too, a lot of times uh, there's children saints, you know, young children. And I mean, it's possible. And I read the Magnificat uh, and they always feature like couple saints a day. And sometimes like people have a calling very young. I mean, really distinct, young, young. And I mean, that says something that's real. You know what I'm saying? I mean, what your kid could be that next saint. Why not? You know what I mean? Seriously. I mean, these are real people um who basically walk the earth and i also think kids appreciate authenticity Mm -hmm. you know like even more so than adults it does resonate with adults too because kids are pure you know what i mean and i think they could like quote unquote smell through it and i think sometimes as like adults we work like ah the the kids can't grasp that no i actually think they can Talk right. about that, your approach as an educator through that lens, because I think sometimes we've watered down the faith. We've kind of like made it too like, you know, like kumbaya ish as and I'm not talking about like, I, I mean, I'm realistic, you know, I'm not going to like uh, read St. Thomas Aquinas to my six year old. Right. I mean, you got to be real. You know what I'm saying? But at the same sure. time. You know, <laughs> I, you know what I'm saying? Like you, you, a kid, you can't expect like kids to like grasp like crazy subjects, but they can grasp the truths of the faith. The the, the Baltimore Catechism is basic. It's basic. And frankly, it worked for a long time. Talk about that, because I think we could do better as a church. Well, I think one of the great things about the saint stories is we have we have what happened. And a lot of times what happened included a lot of suffering. And I think that we can really shy away from sharing those kinds of stories with our children but kids really grasp that. They resonate with that. And I've seen this with my own children. Like in this collection of 20 stories, we have St. Tarsisius who's in there, who if anybody doesn't know the story, he was a young martyr who died defending the Eucharist. And my kids love that story, you know? And we go in this collection of stories, we go straight to the punch. We tell exactly what happened. He died defending the Eucharist. And instead of my kids, you know, really shying away from that, They love that story. They want to hear more about that. And there's some other child saints in here too, like St. Jacinta and Blessed Carlo Acudis, who we, you know, have discovered recently is going to become a saint. He's going to be canonized. And Carlo experienced a lot of suffering in his life too. So I think that telling our children what happened, telling them about the ways that these saints suffered and they gave that suffering to God can really, um, it can help teach our children what our Catholic faith teaches us about suffering. And I think that instead of, you know, trying to hide that from our children, they, they're going to see it and they're going to say, yes, that's real. That's what's, that's the truth. Um, because kids know that there is suffering like they have, they do as children. I mean, they experience disappointment and sadness in this very visceral way. And I think when they hear these stories about these saints who experienced pain, that they really resonate with that and that goes deep with them. And they want to hear more about why that saint was faithful. So that, um, You'll see, you'll see examples of that in all of these stories. See, I, I, I never, I, I don't understand parents who, let's say, for argument's sake, try to shelter their children uh, from, from the idea of suffering or cover right. their ears when it comes yeah. to that. Um, because what, hey, no matter what a parent does, every human being is going to suffer on one level or another. Yes. Um, at least from the Catholic perspective, uh, we, we can make sense truly, not, not just in some superficial way. We, we could truly make sense of that suffering. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it becomes meaningful because Christ made suffering meaningful. Obviously, that's what the saints. I mean, I cry every time I, I read the story of perpetual and felicity. I, I, I do. I'm a big mush. I'm, there's nothing I could do about that. Um, but like when, when I hear about that, or you, you know, you mentioned uh, some of the other saints defending the Eucharist. I remember I had a um, my one my one of my professors at Seton Hall University was also the uh, the theater director. So before, and I, I was an actor in another life uh, at Seton Hall University, and he would end every pre shift, like as it were, before we went on for the for the show. Uh, and he would say, St. Genesius, pray for us, right? So St. Genesius was a, a Roman actor uh, who had a, a an epiphany um, on stage and uh, and and realized that while they were in the process of, of making fun of the Eucharist, uh, as the Romans did, uh, he couldn't do it. And he actually gave his life for that. He converted like kind of on the spot. Uh, talk about talk about suffering. That's they were putting pressure story. on him. To, what's that? That's an amazing story. That's incredible. I love that. Yeah, yeah, they were all like, you know, all the Romans are all there laughing and they're clapping and they're making fun of these this Jewish sect, you know, like because that's what Christianity was at that point. Yeah. And yeah, he couldn't go through with it. And um, they tried to convince him and they told him, you know, this will all go away if you just acknowledge that you made a mistake. He said, no, that's mm-hmm. that's actually that's really actually the, the person that they worship cut his head off. Um, talk about talk about suffering. So, I mean, again, I don't want to get along. I mean, you wrote the book. You wrote the book about the saints. Um, and uh, it's Eucharistic saints again, Saint Genesius and others that you wrote about. Twenty stories of devotion to Jesus. That's from Tan Books. Joe Rosinello. Uh, oh, and by the way, everybody out there, please buy the book from the publisher. We always ask that you support not only our Catholic authors like Meredith Hines, but also support our Catholic publishers like Tan Books. Uh, like Ignatius Press, like Sophia Press, and mm-hmm. others. Joe Resinello. Meredith, when you were putting this together, uh, did somebody, like when I mean somebody, one of the saints surprise you in a way? I think saints find us. I have found that. Like certain saints, you know, be it our personality, uh, be it what we're going through, be it our own vocation. Um, but putting this book together, was there like a trait or a saint that really jumped off the page in a way that you didn't expect? I really loved learning about Blessed Carlo Acudis, and he, um, I didn't know much about him. I just knew that as we're looking toward maybe his canonization, and now we are looking toward his canonization, um, it was this teenager who seemed to be, you know, he was living in Italy, like in the 90s and the early 2000s and those kinds of things, which really resonated with me because that was about the same age as me during those times. And what I, what I found when I opened up some books and read about Carlo was that he was totally sincere and he was starting to like use the internet, you know, back when it was like really new and that kind of thing. And he was using it to be sincere and genuine and present the faith. And I just needed that witness so much because in my work as a writer, I'm in and out and online and those kinds of things. And there is so much cynicism and so much negativity and so many people like trying to tear other people down. And Blessed Carlo was the opposite of that completely. Like he was perfectly sincere, perfectly genuine, and actually, you know, wanted to use this powerful tool to help other people understand the faith better. And so that really, I mean, I just, I got a little picture of him. He like sits on my keyboard now. Like I've got this little picture of Blessed Carlo Acutis. And I ask him to pray for me as I'm like going about like doing these things online because there are so many, you know, so many ways that that can go badly. But like just at, just prayers asking him to help me be sincere and genuine, like, you know, in the ways that he was. So I really enjoyed writing about him. And it was, it was amazing to me that he wasn't just doing this project, this Eucharistic miracles project. This wasn't just something that he was doing by himself, like working on this project. He was actually talking to people about Eucharistic miracles, like in his real life, he was talking to people about his faith all the time. So he does, you know, he just wasn't compartmentalized in that way of having like, Oh, my faith is over here. And my friends are over here. He was telling people about it, um, always. And so he was a really 
beautiful witness to the faith in that way. And he meant a lot to me, like as I continued this project and especially toward the end of the project when there was a lot to do and not a lot of time, like asked blessed Carlo, like, please pray for me, please help me finish this. And I think that really it is through his intercession that the project was finished on time. You so. know, it's, it's funny. I don't That's know that awesome. much about him either. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, there's miracles attributed to him. Right. Yeah. Like they're miracles straight up. And he's also, I've seen pictures, uh, he's in a CC and he's basically perfect. Like he's dead and he looks better than a lot of people I know, Meredith. Uh, so, I mean, like he looks perfect. You're the talking about that, me again, Joe. No, he's no, no. Like he looks better than me. <laughs> in all honesty. Say, he looks better than me. But, but, but the thing I find interesting about that and you talk about like a lot of different voices and Joe and I to be truthful, the kind of pride ourselves. We're not perfect by no means. Uh, but right. we talk, we do talk to a lot of different people. That's one yeah. of the aspects of the show from mm -hmm. Athanasius Schneider to people who, uh, you know, have, you know, all over the place. We'll talk yeah. to you. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. And people have an issue with him. Like I have read that. And I always point to, how can you have an issue when miracles are attributed to you? I mean, I'll listen to you if you have a miracle attributed to you, but you don't. He does. So I'm going to like take that serious. And he's also perfect. Like he didn't like decompose. Like, like, so I think sometimes people get caught up in craziness when the evidence like that to me says a lot. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's just not an arbitrary decision. Like, oh, we're going to raise this guy up. You know, please, yeah. your comments. Well, I think that like in any of those cases of doubt, if that is like what someone is experiencing, like, or with any saint, actually, no matter how you feel about them, one of the things that I think is really cool to do is go read the story about the miracle that's attributed to them. Like go, like, it's usually pretty readily available. Like go read that story. And I think that the character of the saint will appear to us in a new way when we read that story. Like his, Carlo's beatification miracle had to do with this little boy who had been, like he'd been throwing up his entire life. Like his parents didn't know what was going on. His family didn't know how to help him. Like he had just been horrible. You know, it's like he had had these horrible stomach issues forever. And so then went with his parents who are, you know, his mom, who's faithful Catholic goes to uh, some kind of presentation about uh, venerable Carlo at that point. And they had a relic there and this little boy goes up and he, um, his mother explains to him like kind of what's going on and asks him if there's anything he wants venerable carlo to pray for and the little boy just says no more vomiting and like kisses the relic and then from that moment the stomach issues were gone and so i think that like if like that's really important to do like read about these like beatification miracles these sainthood miracles to like see a little bit more of who this saint is and like the way that they pray for people it's interesting to me that people have an issue you know what i mean but like you know if what it is because in all honesty because i've seen statues of him it, he yeah. looks like a regular person people have a problem with that well, like like they want yeah. like 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 i don't know what, what what do you want you want like uh like not saints come at you from all different angles you know right. what i'm saying like what's the yeah. problem and also like it comes down to me the authority of the church Absolutely. the church declares yeah. saints i don't mm -hmm. i don't if the church does it does and he's mm -hmm. a saint and that's not for me to decide and and when people do that i sometimes i say to myself what are you doing? Like, like it's part of our creed. When we say the, we, we say the creed before we receive, I believe in the saints. It's part yeah. of the creed. Right. Like, like that's part of being Catholic. Mm -hmm. And we, and sometimes like, I, I, I wonder because I don't know that much about him, but I'll be honest with you. I trust that the church is, is doing the right thing because it's okay. the church. I don't mm -hmm. have authority. I, I'm just a guy in New Jersey who has a microphone. That's it. I, 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 and no, and by the way, no miracles have been attributed to me. 
So oh, like, well, like, you like know, you know. not yet. Yeah. So, <laughs> not yet. Uh, so when when the church says something, and 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 frankly, I I'm, I'm glad you brought him up because I don't know that much about him. I'm sure our listeners who should be going out and buying this book should get the book and learn about him because saints point to Christ. That's my well, rant, and I'm sticking to it. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, just really quickly, because you guys are mentioning Catholic publishers. The book that really resonated with me about Blessed Carlo is called A Saint in Sneakers, and it's an Ignatius book. So if anybody wants to jump over to the Ignatius website and check out A Saint in Sneakers, like it just, it really is this beautiful story. Um, well, just collection of evidence about Carlo and what sanctity looked like, you know, for an Italian teenager living in the 90s and the early 2000s. And maybe it's just, it's kind of hard to believe. It's hard to believe that someone who is in this time could be a saint, but that was probably always kind of hard to believe. You know what I mean? Like sometimes when we're in like our own time, it's difficult to like really see what's going on in some ways, but it, I found it really encouraging. I found it to be a beautiful witness. It gave me so much hope about my own children, you know, that it's like, it is possible to live a faithful Catholic life at any time in history. And Absolutely. So, like, as, and you know, all, this is the chance we have, right? In this context where we are right now, like this is our chance to live a faithful Catholic life and to teach our children to live faithful Catholic lives. And I think that that should be, that should be something we approach with hope and not with despair, certainly. No, and I, I, yeah, Carlo can help. No, no Merida, I agree a thousand percent. And we won't get into it because we're going we're gonna to have to take a break. My view and based on what Joe was talking about and, and what you guys were just talking about is to, it seems, this might sound a little bit simplistic to to some out there listening to us at the front line with Joe and Joe. It seems like in the church, one of the main problems is you have one group that thinks that nothing happened before Vatican II. And then you have another group that thinks that the only thing you have to listen to came after Vatican II. It's, 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 and, and it causes, I don't know, causes me a lot of confusion. I was like Joe said, who's the authority? Well, mm -hmm. Vatican II is, a, you know, council of the church. So is Trent. So I could read both and, and learn from both and right. be a better Catholic for reading both. And it seems like anytime there's something like, like a Saint sneakers, that's like far, that's a foreign concept to some people. All mm -hmm. right. But I don't know, maybe St. Therese of Lesur might've wore sneakers if there were sneakers available at the time. I, You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, they did like, they, you see the pictures of St. Therese and her family. And I mean, they're a beautiful family, but they look like a French family who was right. living in the late 1800s. That's what they look like because that's where they were. You know, they didn't dress up or anything like that as like early Christians right. because they were living out their faithful Catholic witness in the time that they were in. So but that's, times, they take, that's always let's hard. Take, so, I, know, yeah. I know, I hear you <laughs> loud and clear. Let's take a quick break. Okay. Meredith Hines joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe, Eucharistic Saints, 20 Stories of Devotion to Jesus that's available at Tan Books. Please buy the book from the publisher. But however, if you have to, Meredith is going to tell us where else you could buy it. Um. Well, you can go to my website, meredithhines.com, and that'll link to a couple of different places that you can purchase this book. Um, and then also I would recommend if you go into your local Catholic bookstore, they are either, they might have a copy or you can ask them to order books too. I think that people don't know that sometimes, but you can ask them to order a book and they want you to buy books from them. And so they'll order it for you. All right. All right. I, I always forget to mention that, Meredith, that, yes, we should always encourage our local Catholic bookstores yeah. to stock the books on their shelves. People will buy That's it. when Father so Fessio you, yells at us, Meredith. That's why he yells at us. He, he yells he, at us all the time. The yeah. president Father of Fessio Ignatius. From, say, from, uh, Ignatius Press. <laughs> but we love him to death. So stick around. We have another great segment with Meredith Hines. We'll be right back. All right. Welcome back, everyone, to the front line with Joe and Joe, Joe Pasillo and Joe Resinello. We are way in the breach with Meredith Hines, and we are discussing her new book, Eucharistic Saints, 20 Stories of Devotion to Jesus, that's available at Tan Books. Meredith, where's your website again? Is it MeredithHines.com? Yes, MeredithHines.com. All right, so and that's H-I-N-D-S, MeredithHines.com. There'll be links there if you want to buy the book wherever mm -hmm. else it's, it's available. Uh, yeah. So with that, Joe Resinello, where do you want to go? One of the best things I ever read in my life was a book on all the Catholic saints and they had blurbs like for the bigger saints, maybe two pages, like St. Dominic got two pages, but like 
St. Joseph Cupertino got five sentences. So I read the whole thing. And yeah. there were some themes in that book, which, I, you know, you, you try to pick up trends. That's what you do in like business school. They make you read case studies and you pick up trends. What works, what doesn't work. Anyway, some of the common themes, uh, devotion to the Blessed Mother, devotion to the Eucharist, which is the theme you're writing about. Uh, devotion to the poor. These are common themes that all the saints, what are some outside of obviously the Eucharistic saints, but what are some of the trends of the saints that you wrote about that really jump out at people? Because this is, if you ask me, if you approach it from a tactical perspective, we want to pick up these traits. I mean, if we want to become saints ourselves, and obviously that's the goal, Mother Angelica says that, you know, don't miss the opportunity. We're all called to be saints. That's the universal call to holiness, which comes out of Vatican II. Talk about these similar traits, the saints in the book. Um, all of them treated the Eucharist like the person of Jesus Christ. They, you see them asking him for things, like very boldly asking the Eucharist, like St. Clair of Assisi asks the Eucharist to protect her, which was very powerful when I was looking at it because you don't ask a piece of bread to defend you. You would ask a person to defend you. So it showed this underlying belief that this was the person of Christ. Um, you hear in the stories, you hear St. Catherine of Siena calling Christ in the Eucharist beautiful. You know what I mean? Like they, these descriptions, these things that they do, like they really believed that this was the person of Christ. And that was something that resurfaced over and over again. And also this belief in the promise that he would be with them always. That was a phrase that I kept running across when I was reading books about these saints. Either they would hear Jesus telling them, I will be with you always, or it was just this thing that they really believed. They really believed that Jesus was physically with them in the Eucharist. And I think that that's a reality that as Catholics, we we believe it. And then we have to like learn to believe it again. You know what I mean? And we have to learn to believe it again, because it's hard to believe. It's really, it's challenging to believe that the host and the wine really is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And so I think when we read their stories, we can be reminded of that. We can watch the way that they interact with the Eucharist, like it really is the person of Christ and kind of recommit to like, I want to believe this, either I want to believe this or I do believe this or Jesus, please increase my faith in believing this too. So, yeah, I mean, to me that, that that's, I don't know how to describe it. Meredith Hines joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. Um, to me, like what you just described the relationship between, let's say, for argument's sake, um, sin and the confessional, that yeah, we 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 kind of need to be reminded. It's like right. we yes. we go away from like we go we go away from the confessional. We're rejuvenated. We're restored, and we know it. Yeah, I don't care what the rest of the world says. We know we're forgiven. Okay. Yeah. As long as we gave a heartfelt confession and didn't with, uh, withhold any sins from Christ, he forgives us. OK. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, then you kind of get caught up in the day to day and the and everything else. And you, you tend to fall away. It's the same, I think, with the Eucharist. We need to be reminded of exactly who that is. I'll tell you a story about something that I'm in, 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 immensely grateful for. OK, because it has nothing to do with me and has everything to do with the Holy Spirit. Uh, just happens to be that my circumstance made it where I can now get to adoration as a volunteer mm. uh, to sit with the Blessed Sacrament mm. for an hour every week because the parish right. that I belong to strives to do that. They want to have 24 hour adoration. So I, I picked up an hour. I was like, I'm going to get more involved. And what did I choose? Adoration. Who's that going to benefit the parish? No, that's going to benefit me. <laughs> I need to be reminded. I need to go there and do a holy hour and pray. Okay. Last week I brought my son. He's off from school. Now I brought my son. We went together. OK, uh, because my wife had to go to work. So we, we went together and we try to do that as often as we can. Talk about I mean, your book is about adoration mm -hmm. and saintly devotion to the Eucharist. OK, um, <laughs> and adoring Jesus in the Eucharist. Talk about and again, I'm stealing Joe's thunder because this is always the question that, that he asks. But it happened to pop into my head. Um, how important is it for all those who want change in the church and change in the world and change in the country? Why don't you go spend five minutes in front of Jesus? Absolutely. Maybe, yeah. that, maybe, maybe that's going to help out a little bit. I think you know where I'm going, Meredith Hines. I'm going to throw that over to you. 
Um, so the one of the parishes that we're involved with here in Colorado Springs has perpetual adoration. And a couple of years ago, I decided kind of in a moment of consolation that I was going to go once a week for a whole hour with my children. So it's a children's holy hour and everybody knows, everybody in the parish knows that this is a children's holy hour and there will be kids in here at this time and they will be loud and you know, that kind of thing. It's just one hour out of like the 168 or whatever it is that there is in the week. And so we go and we spend time with Jesus and we sing some and we read stories. So this, I mean, it's kind of funny to have written this book because this kind of book could be a really good thing to use with children in adoration, that that specific context. Uh, but it's been beautiful. It's been a really beautiful thing. And kind of like you said, it's like, who's the person who's benefiting from this? Like, is this this act of service to the parish or really is this about me and my children just being in the presence of Jesus and getting to sit at his feet and I know that, I mean, we try, we try to teach them. It's like, okay, this is a time to be quiet and to look up at Jesus and those kinds of things. But to know that um, even when one of my children is like running across the back of the chapel, like that Jesus loves them so much and is so happy that to have like these little children in his presence with him. And it's been something that's been so good for my family. And so even if that's not the case where there's a whole children's holy hour or anything like that, I really think that um, parents should take their children in to the adoration chapel or the adoration time at church. So children become familiar with this idea. You know, we take our kids to mass. Um, we can take them to adoration too, even if it's just for this like short little time, because God can do so many things with time. You don't need to restrain. It's like, oh, it's only five minutes. It's like, it's five minutes with God. It's, you know, God can do a lot with that. And I think that, um, if we, if we introduce kids to adoration when they're really, really young, it's going to be something that they're like, that they take with them for their whole life, that they remember. It's like, Hey, you know what? Mom and dad believed that this was Jesus, that this right here, and you can go and see Jesus, you know, during these hours he's here. And I think that that means a lot to kids. And I think that they, their, their belief is so beautiful. Like they, they're, they're willing to accept that truth. Um, in this really deep way that I think is kind of harder for adults. So like when they go in and you point up and you're like, that's Jesus. They're like, okay, yes. Like that's Jesus. I see it. And they'll, you know, they'll wave at Jesus and they'll blow kisses to Jesus and those kinds of things. And it's just been so, <coughs> it's been so good for my family. And that I think, I think it's something to consider at any parish to like talk to your pastor about and be like, how can we get kids in front of the blessed sacrament? Because like, they yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it, I think if 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 Catholics, particularly, you know, because, you know, Meredith Times, I promise we won't get you in any trouble here at the front line with Joe and Joe. We do that Thursday nights, nine o'clock on social media. But when we're talking about all the problems that we have out there and you've got your head in the stand, uh, if you if, if you think that we don't have problems. All right. Uh, you know, some people say, well, everything's great in America. Whatever. Um, I, you know, if if Catholics in particular and there's what a hey, Joe, 80 million Catholics. In America, about 25% of the population is Roman less. Catholic. Can you imagine, I don't care what, what stripe you are of Roman Catholic or you consider yourself to have a particular stripe. Go sit in front of Jesus. Absolutely. Go sit in yeah. front of Jesus. Adults and children, go yeah. sit in front of Jesus. You want to be enlightened uh, as, to, as, as to how to tackle some of the nonsense that we have to deal with? If Catholics did, this, did that, our country changes like that. And then the world. That's right. the truth. No, I, I love your thoughts that, on that. Yeah, no, I think that that's something that I mean, those like, those fears that we have, those things that we see that are going on, like there is nothing that you can't bring before Jesus. And so like to take that heaviness even, or, you know, just kind of like that, that fire of like, what do I do about this? You know, to bring that into the adoration chapel, like Jesus is the one who knows how to direct us in the ways that we need to be directed. And so like, Yes, we should all be more. We should all be at the Adoration Chapel more often. And yesterday I was in they, mass, at, Meredith. Yesterday I was in mass, and tomorrow I'll be doing my hour, my yeah. voluntary hour in front of. The, and yesterday at mass, looking at the tabernacle, I said, "Jesus, I want to be a part of this. Call it a battle. Call it a war. Yeah, call it yeah. call it bringing brothers and sisters to Christ. 
Mm-hmm. Please tell me what to do. And tomorrow when I'm at adoration, I'm going to do the same thing. And I'm going to keep asking him that over and over and over. And he's going to give me the answer. As long as I have an open heart and an open mind, he's going to give me an answer. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that is because he is the answer, you know, like he will give you the answer. He is the answer. And that as we, as we do look around at our faith and our faith in our country in particular, um, he, he will give us the strength to do what it is that we need to do and to see each other the way that we need to see each other and to, you know, to be honest and open and yeah. And to be a part of the change, right. You know, we have to be, yeah. Adoration really is, it is this, and it, it feels almost too easy, right? You know, it's like, well, that can't do anything. But like, I really, I really believe that. I know for my family specifically, for my little family, it's just been so important for us. And, you, of years. and you wrote the book, Eucharistic yeah. Saints, 20 <laughs> Stories of Devotion to Jesus. So we see how, we see how the de- devotion to the Eucharist has affected these people. And let's let's face it. Saints are the ones who changed the world. The book is available at Tam Books. The author is Meredith Hines. Joe Resinello. I want to talk about uh, Eucharistic piety for kids a little bit more. I love the fact that they have a children's holy hour. I've never heard of that. I have heard through uh, the Good Shepherd program, Incorporate, it's a way to teach kids. They have them go to adoration, but that's a little different. I love the fact that kids are just being kids there. Obviously, you can't have a, it's not a playground, but you right. can't expect like them to like recite Gregorian chant at four. You know what I'm saying? Like they're kids. If yeah. the kid wants to like, you know, OK, he's a kid and that's mm-hmm. great. Um, wonderful. I think that's phenomenal. I've also seen uh, you talk about young saints. Are you familiar with Claire Crockett, Sister Claire Crockett? I'm not. No, tell me. I, about I, it. I invite all people who hear this to look her up. She's an Irish saint. She's young. Um, and she was kind of like a wild child who mm-hmm. one day decided to become a nun. And she was a, a phenomenal nun. And she died young, teaching the poor in South America. But she would bring in Jacksonville, Florida, kids to adoration. That's why I'm bringing it up. And there's a movie about her life. Her life really spoke to me because um, I used to party a lot too. And she like turned the switch. And so did I in many ways. So in that movie, she would bring kids and they really responded. And then they would interview these kids like later on in their lives. And it made a deep, deep impact on them. And that's like what you're saying. Like it is a that seed. You said it's so simple because it is. Mm -hmm. It is. And kids get it. Adults get it, too. All you got to do is sit there like right. Christ speaks to our heart in a way that words and people can't just get there. You feel the peace. We all looking for peace, right? Everyone wants peace. Sit there. Talk about that a little bit more, because I'll be honest with you. I think that's the selling point to people. I think that's the turning point for America, particularly the Catholic Church. But it's open to everybody. I say this to people all the time. You don't have to be Catholic to go to adoration. You don't. Yeah. Yeah. Sit there. What's the problem? Sit there. You think I'm crazy because I believe this or that Well, sit here. Tell me how crazy I am if you keep doing it and you feel the peace in the air. Kids respond to that. Kids feel it too. What do you right. think? Right. Um, I think that it's, it's about with the kids, it really is about making that space like welcoming, you know, for them. It's not like about this kind of, you know, like shushing everybody or like, don't do this, don't do that. You know, like those kinds of things. But like, what we do is in like really beautiful perpetual adoration chapel that's pretty close to our house. It's called the Divine Mercy Chapel. Um, so it's got a big Divine Mercy Jesus like out in the entryway. And then you come in and then there's um, and then everybody puts their heads down on the ground. So I think that's one of the fun things about like taking kids to adoration is like taking them to mass. You teach them the motions like what you do. It's like here when we're in the adoration chapel, we we get down on both of our knees and we bow our head all the way down to the ground. And like it's um, it's just a blessing to see that by the way, like just to like see a little child, like all the way down on the ground in front of Jesus is, you know, so, so beautiful for the adults. And then there's like this red rug that's right in front of the monstrance. Like the monstrance is up on a raised platform. And of course, 
we tell the kids like, you can't go up there. You can't touch that. You know, of course it's like, this is the spot where we are. And we just kind of gather on the rug and it's like, we're around his feet almost. It's like all of us. And I bring my children, friends bring their children sometimes too. And so we're just kind of like all gathered around his feet. And I think that that is something that children will really remember is my hope is that all of us are kind of like gathered around there. And like you said, like you go and you sit in front of Jesus at adoration. So it really is this physical experience. And so it is different from when we're, you know, and of course we should pray in our own homes, but it is this different thing. There is this kind of awareness of like something about this place is different. And what's different is the physical presence of Jesus. Absolutely. Meredith Hines joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. And we're discussing her new book out from 10 books, the Eucharistic Saints, 20 Stories of Devotion to Jesus. Now you can buy it at 10 books or you could go on Meredith Hines, H-I-N-D-S, H-I-N-D-S dot com. And there'll be links there to buy the book wherever it's most convenient for you. We would just very simply encourage you um, to do so. So we're talking about adoration. Okay. Um, what are... Okay, let, let's let's get back to kids because we want to make sure that kids keep the faith, obviously, as they get older, okay? Yeah, um, and it's an unfortunate thing. Many kids, I, I'm raising my hand, all right? Because uh, I straight away, and I went to Catholic high school mm -hmm. and, and from 18 to 38 became what Joe just described, like a an animal, all right? And, and had to come back to the church. The right. faith never left me though. I, I think I walked away, but you know, was it all those seeds that all good people and prayers that were planted along the way, uh, yeah. obviously in hindsight helped me out tremendously. But what, what are some of the ways Meredith in your experience, can we really effectively um, implant the faith in our children? Um, let's say, in, 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 I, I guess the best word I, I just use it is really effectively. So to try to safeguard them losing the faith down the road. Um. Well, and I mean, since I wrote this book, I guess it's like, this is where I'm going to say that stories are really important. And I think that stories speak to children in a way that maybe just like telling them how it is doesn't. So like sitting down with your kids and that's, that's kind of this like, warm and lovely moment, right? When a parent is like opening up a book to read to their kids, maybe not always, maybe sometimes things go off the rails, like that totally happens around here. But I think that we can give our children these stories and maybe that's going to resonate with them a little bit differently than just like mom and dad telling them, okay, you have to do this and then you have to do this and you have to do this. Um, if we can kind of impart the truths of our faith through these stories, through the stories of the saints, like that's going to give, that's going to give our children something to remember that wasn't necessarily just like mom and dad saying, this is what you should do. Because I think that teenagers kind of go through that time. All of them do of like questioning what it is that their parents taught them. And that's kind of like a normal, like phase of development, that kind of thing. And I think there's a lot of teens who stay really faithful and those kinds of things too, which is really exciting to see. But I think that if we can give our children, you know, kind of these, like a more multidimensional experience of the faith, like seeing or hearing stories of the saints, like sitting in an adoration chapel, like maybe even getting to like, look at some like really cool relics and those kinds of things, or even like traveling somewhere and seeing these churches so that our, our children understand like how big our faith is. I think that that's something that can really impact them. And having other loving adults in their life, like their godparents, like their aunts and uncles, those kinds of things, those people giving them a witness of the faith as well. I think that that's a really key factor in children keeping the faith is like, was there in their growing up, was there this community of adults who both loved them and loved their faith? And I think that they can really, they'll look back on that and they'll be like, there was something going on there. And that's something that I want to keep. I don't want to walk away from that. Absolutely. So, I mean, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Mary. Saying all of that, like my youngest, my, my oldest child is seven. Right. So like it's um, so, you know, take all that with a grain of salt. But I think that that's something that really does mean a lot to my own children. Like we are blessed to have their godparents in the same city. And so like for them getting to have this relationship with their godparents, but any other loving adult who also, you know, really loves their faith like just kind of like nurturing those relationships too, because parents need that support also. Like you really can't do it on your own. 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Meredith Hines uh, joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe Racinello. You're talking about beauty because like, beauty resonates with kids. I mean, you take yeah. a kid to like a cathedral, like, a, yeah. you know, to St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. I mean, it's immense. And I mean, I think that's something, again, you know, t- people could take for granted. Oh, they're not going to appreciate that. Or they see stained glass or they I mean, there's so much beauty in the Catholic Church that children, it could, you know, even I mean, never mind kids, adults, you see something you're like, oh, my gosh, that's incredible. Um, and it's there. And and beauty speaks to the inner part of a person. Um, and, and to your point, I, I think that type of exposure is very important for kids. Um, and it's everywhere. I mean, even your reg, you know, your church in your town is beautiful. There's a lot of beautiful things in that stations mm-hmm. of the cross mosaics in the church. You could point that out. Um, talk a little bit about just beauty, because I think that is at, at its base. Cause I, I'll be honest with you, Meredith, I'm, I maybe cause it's, it, it's like my background as a simple, humble Southern Italian man. Um, <laughs> Italians were, uh, we're built low to the ground cause we're made to put cement on it, Meredith. That's how we uh, grow up in New Jersey. I mean, like I, I approach things from a very basic perspective, mm-hmm. but I think that's the best way to do it. Christ right. was a simple man, his mm-hmm. mother and father. They were simple people. We get too complex sometimes yeah. with our thoughts and our ways and children remind us that just beauty. Talk about just the, the sheer importance of pointing out beautiful things in a simple way. And I think that resonates not just with kids, but with adults. Yes, absolutely. I think that um, well, and like walking around with my own children, they're always pointing things out. You know, it's like, oh, look at that bird. Oh, look at that tree. Mom, the moon. I can see the moon during the daytime. Those kinds of things. Like children are both attuned to like the beauty that we create, like the beauty of our churches um, and those kinds of things. And even um, looking around that church during mass, maybe the kid is not able to concentrate on mass, but they can look up at like, all of these beautiful symbols that are there. And I think that that's, you know, a way that they can participate in mass in that way too. But um, I think that children really resonate with the beauty in nature also. And as we go through, you know, this time of ordinary time, and we're hearing a lot of the parables that Jesus told during the gospel um, in the Sunday, in the Sunday mass, uh, he talked about nature a lot. He talked about the beauty of nature a lot. And something that that made me think of recently was like his mom and his dad, of course, you know, Mother Mary and St. Joseph must have pointed these things out to him. And like they must have talked about these things together. Like that's kind of what I what I hear when I read those stories about those parables um, is that when Jesus was trying to teach people, he pointed to the beauty in the natural world and he pointed to um and that's what we can do with our own kids too, is we can look around and see how beautiful creation is and see what creation teaches us and tells us about God too. Kind of reminds me of the, uh, the parable <laughs> I heard recently I, I, um, of the, uh, you just described the, the, uh, the mustard seed, yes, the, the, yes, the, the beauty awesome. in that. You yeah. always forget it turns into this huge tree, but then yeah. what's the, what's the punchline? So the birds can have a house. So the birds can have a home. So yeah, yeah it's a, I, it just reminded me of that. Cause I think that was the reading. Um, I believe that was the reading yesterday. So mm-hmm. do you have uh, any social media Meredith? Are you on uh, social media at all? You know, I have a sub stack. Uh, I don't know. People don't always know what that is. It's kind of this, uh, this thing that's been happening in the background but it's this whole um, sub stack is basically writer social media. So like the content on it is long form essays. And so if you wanna come over to sub stack, it's all free or my content is all free. Um, you can search on Substack.com for Meredith Hines and you'll find me there. So, and your website and your website again? My website is MeredithHines.com. All right, and, and obviously there's links uh on the website so if you if you can't buy the book from tan for whatever reason tan books is the publisher of eucharistic saints 20 stories of devotion to jesus there's uh links there uh so that you have other options meredith i want to just throw it over to you for a minute any final thoughts anything you like maybe to impart to our audience um since no we're talking pressure. 
<laughs> if we're talking about children, you know, that kind of thing. I, you, the love that you can show for the children in your life is going to do so much good for their, you know, their catechesis. And we're not just talking about, you know, of course you read them the stories of the saints, like this book and others, you bring them to church and those kinds of things. But I think something that is such a powerful, powerful catechetical tool is the love that you can show them. And then having them in a loving community that's full of people who really teach them from this very young age that they are beloved. And I think that reading to them is a great way to do that. But there's also like, there's a thousand other ways to do that too. So that's that's all I want to leave you with is like, we are this picture of God's love and the, the triune community of the Trinity to our kids. Um, and so don't hold back, you know, don't hold back any of that love from those kids because they need it. They need it from us. Absolutely. What I'm going to leave the audience with is go out and buy Meredith's book, Meredith Hines, Eucharistic Saints, 20 Stories of Devotion to Jesus. Uh, Meredith, thank you so much for coming on the front line with Joe and Joe. Needless to say, you are welcome back here anytime you want to come oh, thank on. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was you great. You were great. Talk. I'll be honest with you. You're so sincere and real, and we love moms. We love oh. moms, <laughs> and you're great. <laughs> you, you really are. And thank you for coming on. I really oh, appreciate absolutely. it. Uh, and I'm going to look into uh saint carlo acutis a little oh, bit yeah. more because of you oh absolutely, absolutely. i'm so glad absolutely to hear that. <laughs> and thank you all out there for joining us at the veritas catholic radio network 1350 on your am dial 103.9 on your fm dial spreading the truth of the catholic faith to the new york city metropolitan area download the app share it with your friends you'll have access to all of our station's content um, and if you like what Joe and I do, we go live uh, Thursday nights, nine o'clock Eastern time on social media, uh, X, Rumble, Facebook, YouTube. That's where we get into some real trouble. So help us out on social media um, and like, subscribe, share, hit a button. Uh, do that for us. And remember, until the next time that our conversation is your conversation and that conversation is going on everywhere. We'll talk to you soon.